episode of Progress, Potential, and Possibilities, discussions with fascinating people designing a better tomorrow for all of us. I'm your host, Ira Pastor. Welcome, everybody, again to another episode of our show, bringing you another really fascinating guest today who is helping to create a better tomorrow uh, on many different fronts. Uh, today, we have the honor of being joined by Dr. Marilyn Rusink, who is Professor Emeritus, uh, Plant Pathology, Environmental Microbiology, and Biology at Penn State University. Uh, Dr. Rusink is a, an expert on viruses uh, from both their evolutionary pressures and mechanisms to the ecology of viral diseases. Uh, she performed some of the, the first experimental evolution studies on plant viruses uh, and pioneered the first virus discovery work in terrestrial systems by deep sequencing of wild plant samples, especially of hers uh, in, is the symbiotic relationships between plants and so-called beneficial viruses, uh, which we'll be getting into. Uh, Dr. Rusin completed her undergraduate work at University of Colorado Boulder, uh, received a biology degree, and then four years later earned her doctorate in microbiology and immunology uh, from University of Colorado School of Medicine. Uh, Dr. Rusin joined Penn State as professor of plant pathology and environmental microbiology and biology in 2011, uh, holding appointments in the College of Agricultural Sciences and the Everly College of Science, uh, taught courses over the years in virus ecology, uh, and has also published uh, both popular press book uh, about viruses, uh, virus and illustrated guide to 101 credible microbes, uh, as well as the academic text, uh, Plant Virus Evolution, uh, and we're glad to have her with us today. Uh, Dr. Marilyn Musing, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show. Thank you. Good to be here. It's great to have you. Um, you know, I've, I've enjoyed following your work over the years, and I think, you know, a really interesting place to start out uh, would be uh, this really fascinating adventure, I think you documented it sort of in the mid-2000s, uh, where you and your team are hanging out at Yellowstone National Park, uh, and you come across this uh, interesting species of uh, uh, panic grass uh, growing in the geothermal soils there, uh, has this interesting fungus living on it, uh, Volaria protuberata, uh, and they're happily living together at 150 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, but you realize that if you separate these two species, that they die pretty quickly in the heat. And you figured out there was a third player in this game, uh, something that you named uh, Curvularia thermal tolerance virus. Uh, take us back, if you would, uh, to these early days uh, where you first encountered this uh, amazing uh, viral fungal plant symbiosis, which turned you on to this really neat uh, uh, mutualistic uh, beneficial situation that uh, sort of guided the next couple decades of your career. Sure. Well, I have to give credit to my fungal colleagues. I didn't really do the initial work, um, but I was working at a research institute in Oklahoma at the time. And um, well, summers are brutal there. So I found a way to get out of Oklahoma for the summer every year. And I did work in various places. I did a lot of work in Costa Rica, but I also worked with some colleagues that were based in Seattle and were working on fungi, beneficial fungi in plants. So we looked at things like, we, we did some work on the San Juan Islands, looking at um, fungi that conferred salt tolerance. And then they, they're the ones who discovered this fungus in the plant. Um, and I thought it would be interesting to look for viruses. At the time, for one thing, very few people had looked at fungal viruses. And I had been doing a lot of population work on RNA viruses. And, and I thought it would be interesting to look at a virus that would be probably not be transmitted much. So be kind of a um, resident in its hoax, long-term resident, because that's the lifestyle of most fungal viruses. So I said to them, why don't you send me your collection of a fungi from Yellowstone and I'll see what's in there. Well, so that's really, I, I mean, I did go to the site in Yellowstone. I managed to do that, but not um, in the way that my colleagues did. Like I wasn't really trekking through geothermal soils <laughs> and <laughs> endangering my life by getting out there. Um, they used to go in the winter and then ski into those places sometimes nice. too. But uh, anyway, I did get there, but more as a tourist than a, I mean, I went with them, but more in a tourist capacity, I'm really a lab rat. Um, I try to frame myself as an e a viral ecologist, but I haven't really done a lot of field work myself, just supervised some of it. 
so anyway, they sent me this collection of fungi and uh, when I and when I isolated double-stranded RNA from them, that's a really easy way to look for viruses. Mm -hmm. um, I noticed that all the ones from the geothermal soils had a virus and the ones that were not from geothermal soils did not have the virus. So mm -hmm. that's where that started. It really wasn't, I wasn't really looking for that, but you know, that's usually how our best discoveries happen serendipitously. So then of course that seemed really interesting. It was a really hard job to, to actually prove that the virus was required because first of all, we had to cure the fungus of the virus. Mm -hmm. That's not very easy. Um, they're, you know, they are persistent viruses because they're very persistent. So <laughs> um, it was almost, it was really an accident, an accident of freezing and thawing that we ended up with a fungus that did not have the virus. Mm. So then we were able to reintroduce the virus and then that gave us the system to really study it. So we were able to show that it absolutely was required. Without the virus, there was no thermal tolerance in the system. And then we also could move it into other plants like we did it in tomato. Mm -hmm. So that was very interesting too because of, uh, you probably know the grass is a monocot and tomato is a dicot. So yep. those are sort of two different worlds of plants. And since it was, since it worked in both, that was pretty interesting that it had such a broad spectrum like that. Yeah, so that's where that all came from, but it really got me interested in beneficial viruses. And I, I started to think a lot more about that, mm -hmm. about how viruses could be beneficial. And I think slowly people are starting to embrace the idea, especially now. Now there's so much more data about viruses with all the discovery going on and deep sequencing in so many systems. Yep. And people are finding all these viruses in there. I remember hearing a talk from a student um, a few years ago and uh, you know it was sort of early in those discovery age. And she said, yeah, we found this virus. So now we're trying to find the disease it causes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, why would you think it causes a disease? But, you know, it's been the mindset for a long time. And the very name, the very word virus means poison. Yeah. Um, so it's not surprising that people have been um, a little leery of this idea of beneficial viruses. But now that we're finding so many, like billions of viruses everywhere we look, yeah. it's clear that, that most of them don't cause disease. You know, it's interesting. I, I was um, uh, I was watching a presentation that you gave. It was a couple of years ago at the uh, the Department of Energy uh, Joint uh, Genome Institute, uh, and you in this presentation, you, know, you started off uh, introducing some terms. And I'd love to introduce a couple of these now as we as we get further into this. Uh, you started it off with a, a comparison of the term metagenomics, so basically uh, the sort of the, the study where you collect a lot of genetic materials from nature that are sort of mixed, whether it's you know, this lake water over here or some mud or what have you, versus what you were more focused on, which you termed ecogenomics, sort of looking right. at very unique genetic mechanisms in a specific species, like whether it's talking about this particular fungus as an example, and really understanding the various responses. Talk a little, introduce us to that to begin with, so we, so we have that term uh, as we as we go further into our discussion, if you would. Sure. So I know other people have used the term ecogenomics now in different ways, but um, I I think I used it first. I might not have. I don't know. But what we were, you. I mean, this it kind of came from our work in Costa Rica. So um, what's what I call the lawnmower approach, which is metagenomics. So you go to an area with a lawnmower and you cut down everything and then you put it all together and you see what's there. Um, and so with, with the ecogenomics approach, we actually isolated double-stranded RNA in our methodologies um, from individual plants. So one plant at a time, and that's much more laborious, um, but it also gives you a lot more information. So, you know, it, it allows for different kinds of studies to look at, like, what was related to what, what viruses are moving around, um, and so in the end, we sampled about 12,000 individual plants, most of them in Costa Rica, but some also in Oklahoma and the Tallgrass Prairie Preserve. Um, I'm sorry to say that they were never all analyzed. Um, we had a 
actually, this is a little sad story of COVID, but uh, our freezer, one of our freezers went down during COVID and nobody was in the building and nobody noticed it. So uh, most of those samples are now gone, which is really, yeah, very sad. But on the other hand, I'm sort of winding down my career. I, I had found a few people that were interested in pursuing more analyses of these samples, but um, yeah, that won't be happening now. So, but we did learn a lot from the process. And I guess one of the most significant things to my mind, and it, and it also moved me in a little different direction in virology, was that in plants, um, the most common viruses that we found were what we classify as persistent viruses. So these are viruses that infect the plant from its, for its whole life. They're only transmitted vertically. They don't have any horizontal transmission as far as we know, although we've had some hints that they might. Okay. Um, but basically they're in the seed, they're in the plant, and they're passed on to the next generation. And plants are full of these. I mean, most, most plants have them, a lot of crop plants have them. So um, the interesting thing when you think of it from an ecological point of view is that when you have that strict vertical transmission, it's, those are usually um, lifestyles that are for mutualists. So okay. if, the plant, if the virus was, a, was a detrimental to the plant, it would have gotten rid of it somehow over, gen I mean, we're talking about in, in some cases, 10,000 years or more, we know mm -hmm. these viruses have been in the plants. So, so it implies that they have a beneficial role in the plant. Mm -hmm. um, so that was, that really, I thought that was very interesting. And also another thing that's a bit hard to tease out. Sure. So we have crop plants, we look at them, we don't really see um, a necessarily a beneficial role for these viruses, but we're not looking at them in the environment where this whole situation evolved. Right. So, yeah. And, and you know, you you published in um, 2011. I think it, it, this was the uh, you know a, a paper. I enjoy a lot of your papers, but this one I think was the beginning when you started really publishing. It was entitled "The Good Viruses: Viral right. Mutualistic Symbiosis, 2011 in Nature Reviews." It's been cited quite a quite a few times in PubMed. And here you really walk us through. Um, Obviously, you know, the example with, with uh, the fungus and, 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 uh, and heat tolerance, but you get into some of the, the unique relationship of viruses and insects and, and all the way up to mammals and not just um, uh, involving sort of uh, issues, uh, evolutionary components in, in the placenta of mammals, uh, ways that certain viruses that infect us make us resistant to other things. And it was interesting because um, uh, a couple of years ago, actually, I talked to, uh, to Jack Stapleton, the University of Iowa, you know, who's very pod on GB virus C or hepatitis G and that ability to, you know, somewhat protect HIV patients. Mm -hmm. Talk a little, you mentioned, you know, obviously you started the, this thing rolling in terms of really thinking, yeah, there are some really bad things there that infect us, but there's lots and lots of viruses out there that are potentially very good for us. Talk about sort of where we are in 2022 as you, you know, you, you published in 2011, sort of this, this, this concept. How has sort of the uh, evolution of the, of the beneficial virome uh, taken off around the world. Now, you know, where are the hot, obviously you hotspot at Penn State down the road here, but what else is going on in, in terms of the, the beneficial mutualistic virus research in 2022? I would say it, it's, to me, it's disappointingly still far behind. Okay. Um, there are definitely other people interested. And I really think that this whole discovery era that we're living in now with viruses has opened people's eyes to the fact that yeah. all these, you know, thousands of viruses in everything can't all be causing disease or there wouldn't be anything left alive on the planet. Um, and then also a lot of the work in the oceans has been really clear. Not so much, there has been, there have been examples of, of viruses that are clearly specifically beneficial for their host in the mm -hmm. ocean. But then there's also the whole thing about how these viruses are critical for the balance of our ecosystem. Yep. So how all the, the turnover, um, this the oxygen that's released from the oceans due to virus lysing of bacteria. Um, I saw something the other day, I think it was a talk that Lynn Inquist gave a few years ago about the future of virology. And, and he said that 
Uh, I've heard lots of big numbers about the oceans and Chris Suttle is really good at coming up with big numbers, but, <laughs> but Lynn said that um, there are 10 to the 23rd virus infections per second in the ocean. Amazing. That's kind of a really, I, I can't really get my head around that number. That, that's just too, it's just mind boggling. But the point is, I, I think people have really especially begun to appreciate the role of viruses in our ecosystem, in the balance of the ecosystem. Um, and in just things like population control, we know that in insects, there's lots of studies in insects about how their populations rise and fall. And now we know that a lot of that is due to viruses. Um, so it's, a, it's an important control. I mean, you know, somehow, sometimes the, if the population is too large, there has to be something to put a break on it. And viruses play that role a lot too. Um, I just wrote a, so I'm actually writing a new book, okay. a, a new popular press book on viruses. And nice. I guess you could say it's like my first book, um, like the introduction of my first book expanded into a whole book. Nice. Um, so it's very conceptual. Um, so I just wrote a chapter on the good viruses. This is uh, kind of this, so this is interesting. And what, what I included in that chapter is not just viruses that are mutualists to their host, but also viruses that benefit us or the planet mm -hmm. in more indirect ways. So, so I think um, those are also really important for us. And the use of phage, for example, in mm -hmm. and especially now in the era of antibiotic biotic resistance, which you know, so many bacteria are resistant to any antibiotics now. Phage therapy may be able to really step in and fill that gap. So it's interesting. Um, excuse me, I have some weird thing on my desk. Okay. Um, I think it's quite interesting that, that, you know, the original discovery of phage, the idea was that they could cure bacterial infections. Yep. And then penicillin was discovered and people forgot all about phage. Mm -hmm. But now we're coming back to it. And so there's been some very nice work. Paul Turner has done some really interesting stuff on phage therapy. And, and he has a wonderful story about a patient who was basically on his deathbed and was cured mm -hmm. with a phage from a lake near, near Yale somewhere. Yep. Um, so I think that that's an area that's coming back as far as those are not viruses that are beneficial to their host, but right. they're beneficial to us. Yep. Um, and, and of course the viruses have been used for a long time in the, the trying to cure chestnut blight, which was a huge disease across the Eastern, Northeastern and Eastern United States and wiped out all the chestnuts. Um, so that fungus, when that fungus is infected with the virus, it no longer kills the trees. But the problem is it's a fungal virus and fungal viruses are very, very hard to transmit. So mm -hmm. um, they have used that virus in Europe. It's been pretty successful to treat uh, chestnuts and sort of revive the chestnut forest there. But in the, in the United States, that hasn't worked very well. That's a kind of complicated story, but there's still potential there mm -hmm. and people are still working on that. So there are ways that viruses can really um, benefit us beyond being just mutualistic. And then I guess one of my favorite stories of mutualistic viruses is the one um, about the mice, the, the herpes virus in mice, which yep. suppresses bubonic plague and, yep. and listeria. And that's a wonderful story too. So um, I think that those examples are, the reason they're so few is because people don't look for it. Mm -hmm. And so I remember about, we published a paper in the mid, I want to say 2008 or so okay. about viruses conferring drought tolerance to plants. Yep. And after that paper was published, I had so many plant virologists say, oh yeah, we've seen things like that. We, we just, we didn't think about it, you know, and we just thought it was some fluke or something weird um, because people weren't in the mindset to think that a virus could provide a benefit. Um, but I think that's changing and people are becoming more aware of that. So there's been work in like the, the grasslands of Idaho and the sort of Western United States where they find that virus infected plants do better under drought conditions too in the, in the field. So these are like in native settings where that happens. 
Um, so what? people are opening their minds. I guess that's really what it takes, right? People yeah. might see the same thing and as I saw and not think of it in the same way because no. their mind is just stuck on the fact that a virus has to be a pathogen. Right. Yeah, I mean the, the phage example, phage examples are are are, are wonderful. And we, we also we did a, an episode on, on sort of oncolytic viruses uh, a little uh -huh. while ago. Um, sort of a, you know that's a sort of subset of of, of uh, phage uh, possibilities. But when it gets you know, when, thinking about um, some of these uh, agricultural, uh, I mean you mentioned the one about the, the chestnut uh, uh, fungus and that and that. Um, you know, as you get into obviously, you know, heat, drought, but then obviously all the other things <laughs> that destroy or are in danger, from, whether it's frost or salinity or, you know, here we are in this world where we're dealing with these major ecological problems. And yeah, it'd be nice to be able to, to grow crops in the desert or near the North Pole or in the ocean or, <laughs> or near on the beach or whatever. Um, Talk a little bit about that, if you would, because I, I think that is an us. I mean, I remember someone once presented the figures to me on, on just frost. Uh, what happens after like a day of frost? Mm -hmm. To the right. to, uh, our, I mean, it was it was a staggering number. Um, yeah. Any interesting other areas that you see in terms of um, the crops we eat yeah. <laughs> and the potential right. for some of the uh, these interventions? Yeah. So, in fact, cucumber mosaic virus, which was my favorite lab rat for my whole career, really. Mm -hmm. um, that confers cold tolerance as well. So we did an experiment once where we put, we had, and this was with red beets. Okay. Um, if they're infected with CMV, they, they tolerate a frost where if they're not infected, they die. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're very cold, they're very frost sensitive if they're not infected. So those kind of things, um, that might not mean that you could grow them in a really cold sure. climate or something, but it would mean that that if you had an early frost or a late frost in the spring, early frost in the winter mm -hmm. or fall, that you might, your plants might survive through that, get through that and extend them long enough to be harvested. So um, I think that there are, of course, there are other things too, other microbes confer those kind of things too, like bacteria and, and fungi. There's a huge potential for fungi in our crops. Okay. Um, I have some colleagues that started a company in Seattle they're the same colleagues that worked with me with the Yellowstone project, nice. but, but they are they are developing um, fungal strains that can go can, can be they they've developed a way to inoculate seeds and and then they so these plants all the seeds are colonized then when they germinate mm. by this by this fungus cocktail that they have, which is which I don't have any idea what's in it you know because it's proprietary now sure. but. Um, but you can buy it on Amazon. It's called, I think it's called BioInsure or something like that. I used it in my garden last year. Um, so these confer drought tolerance. They, and they just are, they grow more vigorously. So um, there, so I think in the area of beneficial microbes, we're, what we really have to do because we're facing climate change and we're facing a lot of difficulties in growing our crops and increased population and less arable land and more damage to the soil, more salted soil from, you know, years of irrigation that goes on and on, that we have to think of every way we can to improve our crops with microbes. So I think microbes are the answer for the survival of, of humans and our crops in this age of climate change, where everything's going to be more extreme. That we, so I think viruses are part of that story. They're just one part. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we have, a, we found a virus in peppers that um, deters aphids, for example. Okay. It's one of the persistent viruses, pepper cryptic virus, and plants that have the virus are not as attractive to aphids, and then aphids also don't reproduce as well on those plants. Um, that's a persistent virus, not easy to move to another plant, but I think it could be done. Um, so that could be like a layering, right? So those plants, if they have that virus, and then they also have maybe some fungal endophytes, and, you know, we're going to have to have complex systems in order to mitigate the things mm -hmm. that need to be mitigated because of the change in our climate yeah. and the need for more food. So I think viruses are part of that story, not the only part, but a part. Got it. No, you, you, you got me thinking of something. This is a, a side note. Um, 
uh, when you were talking about obviously the the tremendous amount of viruses that are are floating around in the oceans. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, a couple of years ago, we were down in the Caribbean and they were having a horrible problem with the sargasso seagrass. And, you know, a lot of the islands down there were coming up with the, you know, if you took the stuff out of the ocean, you threw it onto the the, the farms, it, it acted as a growth enhancer. And they were always putting it off to like, oh, there's these trace minerals or something. But I was always wondering, wow, what if there, I mean, if there was some viral component to that, have you, have you done any study? I know ocean, uh, ocean plants and and marine plants are uh, its own sort of biodiversity on its own, but did you ever look at any viruses in in those pieces? I I have not, uh, other than maybe once or twice, a little eelgrass I looked at once. Um, And there are certainly viruses there. I never went as far as to characterize any of them. But it is a project. So now I'm retired now and um, I have a little lab in my garage Mm -hmm. (laughs) and I haven't really done much with it yet, but um, Partly because of COVID, I haven't been able to. I, my plan was to just uh, to do some double stranded RNA isolations in my garage, and then I was going to work in a lab at Oregon State. Um, but you know, I haven't really been able to do any of that part. Got it. But my idea was my pro- the idea for the project is viruses of really weird plants. So um, <laughs> one of those. I mean, I live on the coast now, so I yep. have lots of access to seaweed. Nobody has really looked at viruses and seaweed mm-hmm. much at all. So that's one thing I wanted to look at. Um, I also want to look at carnivorous plants because we have a lot of native carnivorous plants here. Nobody's looked at those for viruses and I'm wondering if they might have some insect-like viruses in them, you know, since they eat insects all the time. Interesting. Um, so there's that. And, and then we also have another plant that grows all over the country, but we seem to have, I have a lot of it in my yard. It's a, um, it's called, horsetail or a variety of other names and I can't remember the Latin name now I'm sorry okay um but anyway it's a, it's considered a very very primitive plant got it so um it's hard to isolate things from it because it has a lot of silica okay. in, the, in it so you have to it's hard to grind it up but um in certain stages that's a lot lower so Interesting. yeah I want to look at that for viruses too I'm thinking if it has some it might have some very ancient persistent viruses, you know, since it's, yeah. since it's been around longer than any other plants that we know of. Really interesting. Um, so yeah, the answer is no, people haven't really looked yet, but hopefully we will. Got it. Okay. I, f- I figure I'd ask the expert while I had you. <laughs> <laughs> um, as you know, you, uh, you document these really interesting two-way and three-way uh, synergies um, in, in this paper and in the other papers you've written. What are some of the, uh, especially as you know, you, you talk about the obviously the herpes bubonic plague connection, but also the you know this hepatitis G HIV one. Any interesting mechanisms of action that uh, you know that that pop up? Uh, are are there interesting sort of uh, anti-inflammatory or an- interferon? I mean, what's going yeah. on at the um, so the, the genomic, the viral genomic level here that is causing these, because I mean, obviously there's so much to, uh, you know, we, we are very primitive in terms of how we sort of approach, you know, with the exception of our vaccines, of course, you know, our, our antiviral armamentarium is kind of weak um, yeah, with a limited array of mechanisms. What kind of interesting mechanisms are you finding uh, or have you been finding along the way that uh, these viruses are inferring uh, that, that gives some of these superpowers to, yeah. <laughs> or these capabilities. So, so that's, I, I don't know how many times I've been asked what the mechanism is for these various things. And to be honest with you, I've never been as so interested. I guess I'm more interested in the ecology of the system mm-hmm. than the mechanisms. But that being said, we know a lot about some of them, like the herpes virus system, that's been pretty well studied. Um, by uh, Skip Virgin did that work. And, okay. and, um, so that that has to do with triggering various immune responses. Got it. Um, and and sort of the, the adaptive immunity isn't such a, so important there. It's it's the innate immunity innate. that gets mm-hmm. triggered, and that's true for other things. Cytomegalovirus also prevents HIV infection at some to some level, and it also suppresses influenza. So that's also again a generalized. Um, kind of immune response. 
that a virus elicits and it affects other viruses too. So, uh, so you know, if you have a cold, for example, you probably aren't going to get the flu. That I don't know if you, I don't, I've never heard of anybody getting the flu when they already had a cold. And it turns out it's not very likely because the cold virus is actually, you know, it's, it's already triggered your innate immune system. Okay. So it's kind of working at high, high top speed. And when the influenza comes around, it just can't get a foothold because mm -hmm. It's, al it's already, um, you're already in an inflamed state. So I guess, you know, if you have your druthers, it's better to have a cold than the flu. Um, so there's a lot of that kind of thing that happens with viruses. Mm -hmm. um, people rarely get two serious viruses at the same time, mm -hmm. unless it's something like HIV, which, you know, suppresses your immune system. Yeah. And then you have the opposite thing going on. Uh, but most viruses actually trigger innate immunity mm -hmm. and that, that does have an effect on any other incoming viruses that might happen to be around. Um, so there's been work with that for sure by other people, not so much by me. <laughs> with, the, with the plants, however, um, I mean, we know some things. We don't know all the specific details, but we know, for example, viruses um, increase the sugar content in plants. Okay. And why they do that, I don't know. Maybe it's because the aphids like sugar and more aphids come around and then they get transmitted better. And, you know, it gets complex when you try to think of the ecology of it. But, but the fact is that a higher sugar content can act as an osmoprotectant. Okay. So we saw other osmoprotectants increased in the drought-tolerant uh, drought plants as well, um, like proline and, and various things that have an effect on the osmotic control in plants. So those are things that are probably a happenstance, right? The virus by, for whatever reason, the virus affects those kind of things. And then that also affects drought tolerance. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't think there's gonna be a common theme like all viruses that are mutualistic in a certain way, do it by a certain mechanism. I think sure. It's just like people always thought there might be a cure for cancer. There is no yeah. cure for cancer, right? There's right. Because cancer is many, many different things. And it's the same with these mutualistic interactions. There are many, many different things. Um, and so some are gonna be affecting one thing and some are gonna be affecting another thing. And we do know in plants so that, that viruses affect um, many genes in plants by what we call off-target silencing. So when a plant is infected, with a virus, it makes these um, these short, these small silencing RNAs that are complementary to the virus, and then that that triggers a whole pathway to chop up the viral RNA. But that process chops up any RNA that has that kind of that has identity to those short RNAs, and they're only about 21 nucleotides long. So there are all kinds of genes in the plant that might have similarity to those too. Mm -hmm. And in fact, most virus um, symptoms in plants are because of off-target silencing of plant genes by these siRNAs that are triggered by the virus infection. So just the same way, um, you may also silence genes that are you know, detrimental in some instances, mm -hmm. like in drought, for example. So I think that's probably a mechanism that occurs in a lot of of plant um, virus interactions where you just get this sort of, it's, a, it's a, almost a random thing, right? Because mm -hmm. it just happens to be a sequence that is found in that RNA. Um, so yeah, so I think mechanisms are um, interesting. I remember once I was asked that question when I was giving a seminar, I think it was in at Illinois, Champaign-Urbana. and. And um, one, somebody asked me that, what about the mechanism? And I said, I don't care about the mechanism. I'm interested in, in the ecology. And they yeah. said, yeah, you can say that because you're a tenured professor, but I couldn't <laughs> say that. <laughs> and that's true. So, you know, um, experience and rank does have its privileges. And one of them is that I, I just felt free to explore a lot of things in my career that um, probably wouldn't have done, you know, I couldn't have done early in my career. <laughs> No, I think it's fascinating. Um, and this, you know, I, I used to joke around that I haven't, I haven't had the flu in a long time, but you know, every now and then, I'll, you know, my kid will give me a stomach when I bring home a stomach virus, and you know, I feel like crap. But then right afterwards, I feel great. <laughs> and I've always wondered, you know, 
Obviously, as you were pointing out, you know, there's all sorts of things that get turned on in the, uh, the innate immune response, you know, separate from the adaptive immune response. And we're learning now, you know, I, I sort of hang out in the world of regenerative medicine a bit, all these interesting components of the innate immune system that are pro-regenerative that we're just learning about in 2021 now, 2022. So yeah, I think there's a, there's a whole sort of, there's many careers there of, of things that we can learn yeah, uh, are... about, uh, you know, what, what these viruses, these good viruses you're doing. Um, it's going to be an interesting time. Yeah, uh, I agree. Well, you know, just a, an interesting thing, you know, you, you wrote, um, I think it was last year, um, you wrote an article about um, virus, you know, how, basically how you trace the origins of an outbreak. And, you know, you were you know, obviously focusing on, on COVID in the article, but it got me thinking because, you know, you, um, you work, I have worked with many, um, well, we'll say ancient <laughs> viruses. And, you know, we look at wherever, a lot of the things that like COVID uh, and, and, you know, these diseases that, the viral diseases that cause us a lot of problems from mm -hmm. the mammal kingdom, from bats, from primates, whatever. Um, but, you know, the stuff that, you know, is much older than that, you know, when, when we're talking about some of the plant viruses, um, you know, you never... I, I don't believe I've ever, you know, caught a, a cucumber virus in my life. And, you know, I, I joke around, uh, I was talking to a Lin Fa Wang down in Singapore, the, the Batman, and we were, we were chatting last year, you know, I, like, I ate a lot of sushi. And I don't believe I've ever gotten a, an octopus virus or uh, a virus from a fish. Um, what have you learned along the way as you've been studying sort of the plant viruses, but also obviously everything in this uh, mutualistic world uh, about sort of where that beneficial co-evolution occurs. Uh, is that a, mm. a million year time frame? Is it 10 million? Sort of, where is that balance? Uh, I remember, you know, I'm a big fan of the Jurassic Park series. And, you know, in, in the original book, you know, there was this dinosaur virus. And I was, it got me thinking like, wow, are there reptilian viruses around still? You know, have I ever been infected by a snake? <laughs> Versus, uh, where does that beneficial co-evolution uh, seem to be occurring. In, in, yeah, in well, you know, I can, I would say that the initiation of a mutualistic relationship between a virus and its host is usually happenstance, right? It just okay. accidentally, the virus does something. But then if it's a benefit, then you have a selection pressure there. So okay. um, they, I think these things could arise at any time. Once they arise, they stay around for a long, long time, and they probably get tweaked a little bit and you know, one of the things that's interesting about the persistent viruses, which is why I started with the fungal virus in the first place, I did actually look at variation in the population of that virus and the fungus, and I couldn't detect any. Mm. It was like everything looked the same. I mean, other, there were no more vari there was no more variation than what I could attribute to sequencing error. Mm. Um, and that's, was, that's also true for pepper cryptic virus. We looked at it from a where it diverged 10,000 years ago from Chiltepin, it's the same virus, identical. Hmm. I mean, there's like two or three percent difference. It's just amazing. So obviously those are those that plant pepper and this virus are very, very adapted, right? They're totally because the, the virus doesn't tolerate any changes. So whatever, it's got a very streamlined genome. It only makes two proteins but it doesn't tolerate any change. So it's not that, it's probably not replicating at a lot higher fidelity than other viruses. It's just that changes aren't tolerated. So they disappear, you don't find them. Um, so I guess that's one thing you could say, if you look at a virus, how much is it changing? How much variation do you have in the population that might tell you something about how long it's been around that host? So when, when a virus has been with a host a long time, you're probably gonna see less, less variation in it because it's gonna be, and that's another kind of principle of when people look for where viruses come from. You know, this was done with HIV. You look for the, the center of the greatest diversity okay. of the virus. The more, where you find lots and lots of variation in the virus, that's likely to be where it emerged. So it's jumped species. And then it's trying to find a fit, right, with mm -hmm. that new species. And so it's exploring sequence space. Mm -hmm. So you'll see a lot more variation. So that's one aspect of that, how, you know, some of these things, obviously the viruses that we 
the oldest sort of the paleolithic viruses you might say are the ones that are in our genomes mm -hmm. um, we think of those as, as molecular fossils Got it. because they are they've been there for a very long time and you know we can trace those when they diverged um, phylogenetically by looking at them in different hosts um, and there are some of these retroviruses that have been there even as far back as the colocanth has the same uh, retrovirus as we do. Yeah. Um, and so you can see the divergence. Um, so it's hard, in many cases, it's hard to know mm -hmm. where things come from and where they start. But um, and, and it also like for COVID, or I should say SARS-CoV-2, that's the virus, um, that, you know, we're not gonna know all the details for a while yet, I think. Mm -hmm about where it came from and you must have been reading. I did write an article for the conversation, I think about that. I wrote a yeah, couple yeah. of That was the, the, yeah, the yeah. Uh, conversation. Yeah, so I don't, I don't even, that was a while ago. We've learned a lot since I wrote that, that mm -hmm. article, I think, but um, I think still it's hard to know where, you know, and again, it's just gonna be luck if we happen to find something closely enough related to say, ah, oh, that's the progenitor. Mm -hmm. Um, and we may never find that. I don't know if we will or not. But um, yeah, so the basic, I guess the basic thing is if a virus and a host have been hanging out together for a long time, you're not going to see so much variation in the virus. And if it's a mutualistic virus, you're probably not going to see very much at all because mm. it, it means that it's, it's, there's a lot of selection for it to stay the same. Got it. Whereas a new virus, jumping species is a great time for lots and lots of variation. And also that's when they make us sick, right? The, the pathogens yep. are usually the ones that have recently jumped species or we've changed. That also happens like polio. Okay. You know, polio was never a pathogen until the 20th century. Hmm. I mean, everybody had polio before that. We all got polio as babies. And it, it doesn't really, it very rarely causes any disease in babies. I mean, it's, it can, but it's extremely rare. Okay. And normally you just are immune then for the rest of your life. So we cleaned up the water because we, somebody, I think it was first cholera. They discovered that cholera was waterborne. Okay. And they started filtering water for cholera, but then they started adding chlorine, which killed the viruses too. And it killed polio. So when they started to clean up the water, people didn't get polio when they were infants anymore. They got it when they were older. Got it. And then it can cause the neurological disease of poliomyelitis. Interesting. <laughs> um, so it really, yeah, it was actually a product of our cleaning up the environment or the water system. And in fact, I, the, the vaccine was certainly important in the end of the polio pandemic, but it also was partly because we started to clean up the sewage. So even though the water was cleaned up, the sewage was not cleaned and treated until the, like the 60s and 70s. Mm. And so there was still a lot of polio getting into the waterways. And even though it wasn't in the drinking water, it was still in the swimming water and people got polio. That's why it was a bit older, the older kids and adults swimming in lakes and rivers. They probably, that's where they probably got polio. But once we cleaned up the sewage as well, there was a lot less polio in the environment mm -hmm. for anybody to acquire. So that had an impact as well. So, so sometimes viruses become a big problem because we change. Got it. It's very interesting. <laughs> I'll think of it from that angle, but that's, yeah, that's fascinating. Yeah, so it's all, everything's all tied together. That's the bottom line, right? It's all part of one big story. Yeah, speaking of, of tied together, um, we, we've we've done a couple episodes talking about this uh, this concept of of one health, uh, sort of mm -hmm. addressing human animal ecosystem, sort of all together through this interdisciplinary approach and bringing the veterinarians and the medical professionals and environmentalists all together. And typically, it's been sort of you know we talked about this one scenario. On the show we did about, uh, uh, in this case, it was, you know, there was uh, Uganda, there was the farmer, and then they had their cattle, and then the baboon would come, and, and there would be something, obviously, 
transmitted, but they also back the other way. They, uh, they found the first couple cases of, of COVID in, in hippopotamuses uh, recently, which, you know, is pretty sad. Um, but I just think, have you, because, you know, I think of, you know, your work and the way sort of you're looking at this is sort of almost like, uh, not the reverse, but sort of the, the beneficial one health cycle in the sense, you know, can we understand more things about uh, what the proper setup is in sort of environment, animal, yeah. human relationships oh. that there's more good, <laughs> good things being transferred in terms of these good viruses or, uh, awesome. I mean, I don't know. It's a, uh... well, it's an interesting way to think about it. <laughs> I like it. Um, so of course we've got, we've kind of gotten there with bacteria, right? I mean, yeah. everybody knows now that you need a good microbiome yeah. and you need to yeah. eat fermented foods and maybe you shouldn't wash your garden vegetables so thoroughly because right. those microbes out of the soil are actually good for you. And so we've kind of gotten to that place with, um, with, vi with viruses, we're not there yet. I did write a little short piece for J Viral a couple of years ago called Move Over Bacteria. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I like that piece. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah that because one. I think, you know, viruses are important part of that whole story too. And Get those bacteria out of here. Yeah. Get them. Anyway, so yeah, they, they have to take their role beside the bacteria, I think, as being beneficial microbes. Yeah. Um, I think, I hope we'll get there. That's my yeah. goal, that we get there. Um, that's why I'm writing a new popular press book. I think people in this day, right now, people need to know a lot more about viruses than just COVID. I agree. <laughs> um, so I'm, we're hoping the book will be out in June. Okay. I would. I can't give you a title because okay. A, I'm the author, and we don't get to pick the title. It turns out. That's true. Um, and also, we haven't had a, much of a discussion about it yet. So. Got it. But there will be. Um, hopefully, yeah, it's going to be published by Princeton. Princeton University Press. And nice. Anyway, I'm not. I don't mean to give a big plug, but a little. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, please, I, I, I want to help you plug it because I think it's uh, everyone yeah. should be reading <laughs> your materials. Well, I hope. I hope that this will. Um, it, it's meant to have a popular press appeal, you know. And, yeah. Um, yeah. So, and I'm hoping we have some improvements over the last book, like a better font. <laughs> My first book was so hard to read. I think it, it looks, looks pretty cool terrible. with the giant virus on the front there. It's, 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 oh, I love the cover. Yeah, yeah, that's that's the only, the U.S. edition is the only one that has that cover. Mm -hmm. All the other editions have other covers that I never saw until they got published. But um, I, no, I just think that, you know, there were some things that I didn't like. But the author doesn't have much to say about quite a few things in a book, it turns <laughs> out. <laughs> uh, but anyway, I think it's, I, I think that it's, um, I do know that Amazon sold out of it at the beginning of the pandemic. So nice. that was kind of a good sign, I guess. They restocked it, but they did sell out. So um, yeah, so the new book will be a lot more conceptual. And, and I, I just really, that's my goal is to educate the public. And I, I found all my life that if you are afraid of something, you should educate yourself about it. Mm -hmm. When I moved to Oklahoma, there were rattlesnakes and scorpions and black widow spiders. And I mean, there were things that I'm not a, f a fearful person, but mm -hmm. I got along with all of those critters a lot better once I had educated myself about yeah. them. And then yeah. they just aren't so scary anymore. Mm -hmm. So I think that we need to do that with viruses. People need to be educated and hopefully that will mitigate some of that fear. Yep. Yeah, I uh, completely in agreement with uh, with you. And as I said, I, I've been following your work for a while now, and I've just been so impressed by it. And uh, want to help you well, spread the word, uh, spread the word about it more. And um, really, got to be rooting you on. Uh, I, I I'm sad that you left the East Coast here, but hopefully your uh, your your uh, garage lab will uh, expand, and you'll get into OSU and continue to do well I, i'm not really planning on to, i mean I, i'm retired from i retired from yeah, i never retired and i and i have oh i'm not retiring from life <laughs> i just retired from academia sure so i i have list writing as part of my um plans in the retirement and also i do other things now too so excellent i'm nice. learning to weave for example nice. play the piano you know things i didn't have time to do yeah. before so um, I'm, I'm very happy with my new life and I will never lose my love of viruses. I think that's a, I fell in love with them when I took 
microbiology as an undergraduate and met lambda phage and that was it they i just thought this is the coolest and most fascinating thing possible so it's um that will never i don't think that will ever fade yeah well nonetheless we're still reading you on and i'm glad i'm glad you started this uh this journey and, and hope many others uh, continue to pick it up and, 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 and develop this domain as it should yeah. be developed. Um, for, for everybody that uh, is going to be listening to, to this episode of the show uh, on the podcast network, so watching on the YouTube channel, uh, you've been listening to Dr. Marilyn Rusink, uh, Professor Emeritus, Plant Pathology, Environmental Microbiology and Biology, Penn State University. Uh, Keep an eye out for her new book, which should be uh, out in June of this year. But in the meantime, pick up uh, her current books, Virus and Illustrated Guide to 101 Incredible Microbes. If you're into more advanced stuff, she has a really cool text on plant virus evolution. Uh, but uh, Marilyn, I want to thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come talk to us. Uh, obviously, thank you for everything you've been doing over the years, as we say on this show. Thanks for helping to create a better tomorrow uh, through your work. It's it's a very impressive story. Thank you very much. This was really fun. I enjoyed it. Be well.